Yes, yeah, so I'm very happy to uh, introduce um, and Andy. Uh, Andy and I have, uh, well, we both worked at British Antarctic Survey and survived, um, and done several cruises together on the Chesso Hydrothermal Vents project. Um, Andy was uh, head of biological sciences at BAS. I think you hold an honorary position at UEA at the moment. And Andy's uh, an expert on the physiology of polar organisms and ecology of polar ecosystems as well. And he's going to talk about um, the thermal limits of life. Thank you very much, Alex, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, the logic behind what I want to say here is, is sort of fairly clear. If we want to find life elsewhere, we have to be reasonably certain we can identify it when we find it. And one of the ways of constraining our choices is to get a feel for what limits the existence of life on Earth. And there are a whole range of physical and chemical factors that might limit the presence of life, but I'm just going to tackle one, and the title tells you I'm going to tackle temperature. So I want to start with a few definitions, and these definitions are important because if you read any of the literature that has to do with temperature limits to life, you'll find that different people mean very different things with the same words. So I'm going to tell you what I mean by a certain set of words, and then work from that. Then I want to look at high temperature limits and low temperature limits and just have a few remaining remarks at the end, hopefully within the half hour. Now despite two and a half millennia of thinking about it, we've been unable to arrive at a generally accepted consensus definition of life. All we can do is describe the example that we have in front of us. And the figure you see there is a representation of one of the people who is regarded as the first really important thinkers about life and that's Thales of Miletus. We don't actually know what Thales looked like, this is what somebody thinks he looked like. But we can make a few generalised statements about life on earth which are relevant to understanding the thermal limits which I'm going to come on to in a minute. But basically we and microbes and everything else are built around a few small common atoms covalently bonded together. It's intimately bound to the properties of water. Our energy comes in the form of electrons and is moved in the form of electrons. It's stored temporarily as proton gradients but long term it's stored as electron potential energy. We use a very small number of basic molecules compared with the range of molecules that actually exist. Our metabolism is driven by very small changes in Gibbs or free energy. As far as we know from looking across the range of organisms on the planet, the use of energy carried by an electron to generate a proton gradient <coughs> is fundamental to every living organism on the planet. And in a wonderful little phrase from Albert St. Georgie, Life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest. Or as somebody else once said, the secret of life is the electron. He also said in another context, and I also like this, biology's forgotten water, or possibly never ever discovered it. And the context of that will become clear in a minute. Now there are two important people that are always reflected when anyone makes a philosophical or practical discussion about the origin or definition of life. These two names come up every time and I think rightly so. One is Schrodinger, who wrote a classic little book called What is Life, which he got many things right and a few things wrong. The things he got wrong were put right by von Neumann, who is one of the founders of computing and computer theory. I'm not going to go into those, you can read about them in any text and there isn't time to go into what they said, but you can condense their view of life into a little diagram like this which says that life has got three essential components. And I emphasise this is life as we know it on Earth. It has software, that's coded instructions for building organisms. It has hardware, proteins and other macromolecules with which you do things. 
and it requires a flux of energy. And those are electrons, protons, and to some extent, iron gradients. This is sometimes known as the CMP view of life, containment, message, and... It's gone from me. I'll come back to it in a minute. However, one of the conclusions that emerges... Program, Mr. P. Thank you. Um, one of the conclusions that emerges if you look at life from a thermodynamic perspective is that for an organism to perpetuate it has to replicate and one of the distinctions that von Neumann produced in thinking about computers rather than organisms but the thinking is directly applicable across is that there is a distinction between metabolizing and replication or as von Neumann put it between the message and the interpretation of the message and this links through to a classic piece of biology by Weissmann, who understood then that inheritance only takes place through the germ cells. In terms of the promulgation of life, the body is completely irrelevant. It's there simply as a packaging for the germ mind. So this is where inheritance takes place, from gamete to gamete. Now that may seem a little esoteric, but I've come to that because it drives me to what I want to talk about in terms of how we look at life in relation to temperature. And in terms of organisms on the planet, life has to involve a completion of the life cycle. The relevance of that will become apparent in the next slide. For bacteria, archaea and unicellular karyotes, eukaryotes, that's a mother cell to a daughter cell prokaryotes on the left. For multicellular organisms like us, that's zygote to zygote, that's fertilized cell to fertilized cell. That's the complete life cycle. Because of that, it enables us to distinguish three quite distinct thresholds for aspects of life on Earth. There is a temperature threshold within which you, or above which or below which, you can complete your life cycle. There is a separate temperature threshold for metabolism. Those two are not necessarily the same. And there is a third temperature threshold, which is simple survival. And those three are logically and often practically distinct. So here's a bar graph showing you the range of temperatures over which an organism might survive. High temperature on the right, low temperature on the left. The bar here between TL and TL is the range of temperatures over which the organism can complete its life cycle. Its optimum temperature is very often nearer the upper end than the lower end. That's just an observation, very often is the case. Above in this direction at high temperatures, or below in this direction at low temperatures, there may be a separate threshold for where metabolism stops. So we can have, in some organisms, an area here, which is shown in white, which is where the organism is metabolizing but it cannot complete its life cycle. And then at the bottom is the temperature for survival. This may be above the met metabolism threshold, it may be coincident with it, all three may be coincident at the one temperature. At this end, they again may be coincident, or in some cases there are organisms for whom the TS is 1K. So they'll survive down to 1K. But they aren't, and this is really critically important to the argument I want to develop, they are not metabolizing and they're not completing their life cycle. It's simply a temporary time at which they survive difficult circumstances. So that's, I want to home in on that now, and the important thing I want to consider is the temperatures that we know that life on Earth can complete the life cycle. The temperatures we have on Earth have a number of characteristics that are relevant to life. And our temperatures here, covalent bonds are stable. Non-covalent bonds, usually referred to as weak bonds, form and break extremely rapidly. And that's because the characteristic temperature, or characteristic energy, that's Boltzmann constant by the, multiplied by the absolute temperature, is about the same as weak bond strength. In other words, the average energy of a molecule in the cell 
is about the energy required to make and break a bond, a hydrogen bond. That means what we have at the temperatures on Earth are some bonds that are extremely stable and some bonds that break and reform extremely rapidly. And this complex of the two types of bond is absolutely critical to the use of macromolecules to generate metabolism. We also have water, which exists in all three phases. In some places, like in the Antarctic where I work, simultaneously. There are significant fluxes of light and radiant heat, and we do have some geothermal heat from radioactive decay in the Earth. So if we revisit that temperature bar, and now put some animals and plants on it, this is what we find. I'm using the standard thing, which is high numbers have red colours for high, and cold is blue which is really interesting in an astronomical context because, of course, blue stars are much hotter than red stars are, but it's just one of those little things. The records at the moment are microbes and sea ice grow down to minus 20 and in permafrost. There is a debated record from a place in Antarctica called Don Juan Pond, which may have life at minus 23, but I think the consensus now is that is not correct. And in hydrothermal vent microbes, we go above 100 C. As I was just chatting to Charlie earlier on, I now would like to add the word almost in here. <clears throat> because of course there are very, very hot liquids in hydrothermal vents which are outside the range of observed life at the moment. So that should say almost the entire range of temperatures over which water is liquid. We'll look briefly at high temperature limits. <clears throat> This is probably well known to many people, but we'll run through them anyway. At the moment, the records are held by two Archaeans. Strain 121, which grows at 121 degrees Celsius, hence strain 121, and Pyrolobus, which grows at 113 Celsius. Both are Archaeans, and both were isolated from hydrothermal vents. However, culture studies indicate to us that we can, in these cases, distinguish between the limit to the life cycle, which in this case is dividing cells, and the higher temperature at which the cells appear still to be alive and metabolizing, but no longer divide. And that appears to be also the temperature limit for their survival. So in the case of these microbes, the completion of the life cycle is slightly lower than the temperature at which metabolism stops. But this is a very narrow band, and technically is quite difficult to distinguish. Those are Archaeans. The high limit for bacteria is around 100 Celsius. Well, I'm not showing you any data because this is a short talk. And if we move to complex organisms, eukaryotes, then the thermal limit, the upper thermal limits are much, much lower. Generally, a eukaryote cannot live above about 45 Celsius. And the limit for a vertebrate is desert pupfish, which lives at about 43. There are some fungi which have been isolated from very hot environments excuse me, and they appear to grow up to about 60 Celsius. This is an image of fungal hyphae which have been isolated from a compost heap. If we go to the low temperature limits now, it's a site that I know reasonably well from Antarctica, Sky Blue Nonatex, it's one of our refueling aircraft staging posts. And the reason for showing it to you is that even in the center of Antarctica, there is exposed habitat <coughs> with life. The low temperature limits for growth are reasonably well established and there are four examples here. The top one is a classic example where cell division in bacteria within Arctic winter sea ice has been recorded at minus 15. The common lichen which grows way down into Antarctica has been shown to photosynthesize down to minus 17. The yeast that spoils food will grow down to minus 18 which is why your freezers run at minus 20 and permafrost respiration has been recorded down to minus 20 Celsius. And the classic photograph which shows dividing bacteria with the eye of faith as a dividing bacteria by that arrow there. These are ice grains and the fluid is constrained to the little narrow channels between the ice grains. But the, nonetheless, they have bacteria. These data, or available data, were plotted up in a PNS paper by Price and Sowers, 2004, a decade ago now, where they looked at growth, maintenance, and this is a chemical reaction, racemization of amino acids. 
And the key thing here is that there's nothing essentially below minus 20 Celsius. Empirically, we don't find anything living and completing its life cycle below minus 20. And these are prokaryotes in the old term, bacteria and archaea. It prompts the question, what limits activity below minus 20? And we think we understand what's going on. Critical here is that there is ice present in the environment. And as ice forms, solutes and the bacterial cells are excluded from the crystal. So as the ice grows, there's less and less fluid and that fluid gets more and more concentrated. If the cooling rate is slow, then that's in balance and we know exactly what the concentration of the salts in the liquid is because it's defined entirely by the temperature. If it cools fast, it will be out of equilibrium and that, that relationship no longer holds. But the concentration means that the cells dehydrate and or they synthesize compounds which offset the osmotic stress. They, they're called osmolites. They synthesize very small molecules which will back off to some extent the dehydration effect of the increasing concentration of the salts outside. However, the critical thing is that as the cells dehydrate, they eventually vitrify. Vitrification is something which <clears throat> most biologists have probably never encountered and probably know even less about. It's also known as the glass transition. It's an unfortunate phrase in biological terms because the vitrification of a cell is nothing like the vitrification of glass. The vitrification of glass happens simply because the viscosity of the liquid crosses a threshold and the standard threshold is 10 to the 12 pascal seconds. Glass is technically a liquid. It's just moving very, very slowly. The vitrification of cells is a related but slightly different thing which has to do with the increase in viscosity because the colloid comes together and all motion effectively ceases. Once you're below the transition temperature of vitrification, diffusion of gases, diffusion of metabolites ceases. Or strictly, the molecular diffusion period is about 10 to the 5 seconds. It takes, that's the length it takes, the time it takes a proton to get from one end of a bacterium to another in a vitrified bacterial cell. That's a long time. So effectively, the cell, it's not freezing. It's as if it's stopped dead, absolutely free. And it's very interesting that a number of organisms use this as a way of getting through periods of difficulty. And what we don't understand is how the cells regulate the process of going from being vitrified back to being fluid again. And there's a lot of work going on. It looks as though there are a whole range of proteins which are involved in protecting the cell contents in this transition between the vitrified and the unvitrified state. It's not devitrification because in one of these great quirks of science and nomenclature, devitrification means turning into a solid, not reverting the process of de It's just one of those strange things. However, having had a quick flip through and trying to keep to my 15 minutes, I thought I'd finish with a little slide, a slide that gives some astrobiological consequences from this. Microbes in glacial ice are likely to be vitrified unless temperatures are above about minus 20. I say about minus 20 because it's difficult to make a measurement of the vitrification temperature. We've done it for a number of organisms and then that the, the values vary from about minus 22 to about minus 17 depending on the organism we've chosen. So it's about minus 20. So that, that's a ballpark figure. But we can say in general <coughs> terms that if you are a microbe in glacial ice, you're likely to be vitrified unless you're above minus 20, which you will recall from the previous graph is the temperature below which we do not observe any microbial growth. There are reports of apparent microbial metabolism in ice below minus 20, but you cannot rule out under those circumstances concentrated solute chemistry, which is mimicking metabolism. And there are actually isotopic evidence that suggests very powerfully that the observations of apparent metabolism below minus 20 are actually not metabolism, they're chemistry. Chemistry is, of course, metabolism is just chemistry. 
interestingly, because I haven't had a time to go into it in this, but we can talk about it either immediately after the talk or over coffee, is that one of the things that's happened with the evolution of multicellularity is that it's limited your upper temperature for life, you don't go above minus 45, but it extends your survival quite a long way cold. And the last astrobiological consequence is that microbes with an Earth-like composition will be vitrified under present Mars climate conditions. That is an important caveat because, of course, we don't know what the composition of cells on Mars might be. But extrapolating from cells we see here and the way they behave in relation to temperature, under most Mars conditions, they will be vitrified and not doing a great deal. I almost made it in 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have any questions for Andy? John. Hello. First of all, I suppose the vitrification would seem like a good way for things to be preserved in cold environments, but then on the other hand, you can't do any molecular repair under those conditions, right? So is this a bad state to be in in terms of long-term preservation? It's better to be at a slightly warmer temperature where there may be a bit more damage, but at least you can repair things. That's an interesting question. Uh, I think I would broadly agree with you, yes. Um, the thing about surviving un inclement weather is that it's the best of a bad job. Yeah. Um, and so what you, you know, I, I, they don't have any control over, well they, they might have a little bit of control over vitrification, but once you've vitrified, yes, there is nothing you can do. Um, and there's a lot of interest at the moment under uh, what might happen in terms of radiation damage, for example, under those circumstances, because all of the mechanisms that a cell has for repairing damage are frozen, frozen is the wrong word, but we can't avoid using it, that they ceased to operate under those circumstances. So the question then becomes whether or not there is a possibility of retrospectively repairing that damage as you move back to the fluid state. And that's something, as far as I'm aware, we only have speculation about, we have absolutely no data about it at all. But there is, not in the bacterial realm, but in plant seeds, which is where vitrification is also really important, and that's dehydration vitrification. So you can vitrify a cell at a, pl a positive temperature if you dehydrate it enough. Um, they've d uh, long been known and are now being actively investigated, a whole class of proteins whose function was completely unknown before, and they were very bizarre proteins because they're completely unordered. And it would appear that their role is to protect the structure of the plant's seed cells as they vitrify and or as they move back to the liquid state. And these so-called LEA proteins, which stands for late embryogenesis abundant, it's a descriptive, and we find lots of them in late embryogenesis and we don't know what they do, we now find them in a whole range of organisms, all of which have stages that can vitrify, like nematodes and tardigrades and things like that. So it's a really rapidly growing area of science because it looks like it's a much more prevalent thing in the environment than we had first thought, and that there are protective mechanisms for the very problems that you alluded to. I would assume that something like Dinococcus radioturans, which has evolved the capacity to stitch its genome back together again, I mean, that, that seems to be a, an adaptation to extreme dehydration as well. Yes, it's probably, it, it, the, its ability to withstand reactors is probably a side effect of something yeah. you evolve for something yeah. else in time. Yeah. So those minus 20 degrees, they are now for, for single, singular celled uh, organisms. So um, is, are human beings really the record holder? For low temperature, as far as I know, uh, Inuit families they can complete the life cycle even at minus 30 degrees. They just need warm clothing and warm housing and food. And yes, and there, there, I mean, there, there's a trivial answer to that, a flippant answer to that, which is if you take the Inuit out and stick him in the environment without the igloo and yes. the warm clothes, they will not yes. complete the life cycle. So you need at least one environment that is warmer than uh, yeah. minus 20 degrees. But what you're, there is actually a, a less flippant point to answer because it's an interesting question um, one of the physiological mechanisms that two groups of organisms have evolved is warm bloodedness so in this case what's critical to what happens to the cell is not the temperature of the environment it's the temperature of the body 
Um, and that's the distinction. And there are plenty of organisms that will live, that are warm-blooded, and they will live at minus 20, minus 30, and will complete the life cycle at those temperatures. But the critical thing there is that their cell temperatures are at plus 25 or plus 30, plus 40. Mm -hmm. So what they've got is insulation. Mm -hmm. Much more interesting are those organisms that can't control their body temperature, like insects, plants, reptiles, fish. And there are many insects that have to survive minus 80. And they, one of the reasons that they can do that <clears throat> is that the, the environment in which the cells sit, which is the body fluid inside the insect's body, is regulated by the insect. The microbe in the glacial sea ice has no control over its external environment. As the ice forms, the solute concentration goes up. It has to deal with that. But a frog that freezes, and there are frogs that freeze, they freeze seasonally, these frogs control their internal body environment such that the environment in which their cells sit is regulated. And they go into a regular, and actually, the, although it's talked about freezing frogs, it's actually only the extracellular water that freezes. The cells do not freeze. And it looks very much and so they regulate that environment, such as the cells do not vitrify either. But that's, a, that's a, still a developing area of research. In insects, at the very lowest temperatures, such as insects in Siberia or in deep Alaska, those insects possibly do eventually vitrify their cells at, at about minus 60. And the reason it's minus 60 and not minus 20 is that a multicellular organism has the ability to regulate its own environment internally which the archaea and the prokaryotes living here don't. But that, that's a 30-minute talk rather than a 15-minute talk. So I skipped over it. But, but the, the, the question you ask is a good one. Because, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks, Andy.